Father, I do. I want to bring to the stage uh, my friend. I've known Pastor Chris for many years. Amen. Many years ago, me and uh, Pastor George, <laughs> we used to serve somewhere. And uh, <laughs> Apostle Chris would come and uh, be a blessing. So I've known him for almost 20 years. Almost 20 years. And this man has been a great, great blessing. What most of us don't know is that even men alive is an offshoot of what he started in Eastlands. The men's meeting in Eastlands, in Buruburu particularly, was started by Apostle Bishop Chris Atemo. Amen. So we're just continuing what he started. So it's good to have you this morning. And so without further ado, let us just stand as we receive the gift of God. Amen. All right. All that consultation is about time. All right. It's good to see each and every one of you. Uh, I think, and we need to appreciate Reverend Ben as well for gathering us here today. Praise God. Please be seated. By nature, men don't like to be told what to do. Uh, so um, it's a blessing to have you here today. I don't know whether it is, uh, from what I've followed mostly on uh, the various meetings on social media, I asked Pastor Ben at some point, are you having pastor's meetings or men's meeting? Uh, it seems like everybody is either a bishop, apostle, or a pastor. But whichever the case, you're a man. <laughs> you're a man, and it's good to see you all, Bishop Albert, it's good to have you now. I will not do what Reverend Ben did to recognize all of you. Um, but it's a pleasure to be here. Praise God. The way you're looking at me, Pastor George, okay, Pastor George, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, the whole, um, the whole theme has been the restored man. And the question that then would come to my mind is, restored to what? The question would be restored to what? And uh, I'll have a general conversation, and here and there we will throw in a scripture or two. If I knew you were like this, I would have come and sold books by force. Uh, I don't know why I forgot. All right. Where men are, business must be done. <laughs> men cannot gather without money being talked about. You know, that's, that's what makes the difference, you know. You know, for men, money is to men what uh, sex is to women. Money is to men what sex is to women. Um, <clears throat> and I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why. That you see, when a woman gives her body, she will say, I gave you everything. And when a woman gives her body, you can't just leave her. You can't leave her. She, she will destroy you. She will destroy your job, your name, or something because she feels she has given a sacred part of herself. She has given everything. So once she has given her body, she will want to be taken care of by a man. On the other hand, a man, if he gives his body, he doesn't even know what he did. You know, 
for most men, men are not trained to look at their bodies as sacred. Um, that's why a man will stand by the road when everybody is passing in the middle of the day and just decide to pee, you know. <laughs> he doesn't feel like he needs to hide anything over there. On the other hand, a lady will be very careful, you know, um, on how she dresses and dresses wherever she is. A man will just stand over there and finish and get out and actually wave at you in number 58. <laughs> And he'll be waving at you and say, he's here. Because he doesn't feel like there's any private matter that happened. Yet, on the other hand, when a man gives a woman the money, he has given everything. <laughs> he has given everything. Uh, that's, that's where our fights begin. Because once a man spends, you know this thing of eating fair. <laughs> It's a thing of eating fair. And, and women won't understand it because they feel it's just money. This is just, you know, a medium of exchange. But to a man, he has given his sacred part by giving out that money. Uh, so where men are, money has to be talked about. <laughs> Praise God. You know, and I don't know how, how we do this and why we do this, but a man will hide his wallet, but he will easily become naked next to a woman. But he will hide his wallet. So what is going on between men and women is there is a lot of transaction. Men give money expecting to get the woman's body. And when the woman wants to get a man's money, she will use her body. Because when it comes to that, men don't know how to say no. They say yes before they were born. They don't know how to say no, you know. <laughs> so when it comes to that matter, they don't know. I mean, um, there's just one, men have two reproductive organs. They've got two reproductive. One is between their ears. The other is between their legs. Uh, who they become depends on which reproductive organ they use the most. How are you people doing? How are you people doing? I am blood washed, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, when it comes to the reproductive organ in between their legs, they don't need motivation uh, because naturally things flow downwards. So blood just flows <laughs> downwards. But when it comes to them using the reproductive organ upstairs, then you need a push. You see, for, for liquid to go up, it is either by pressure or by heat. You know, there must be something that is pushing it outward, upwards. You've got to pump it a bit. But uh, I hope that the men in here are not men because of the reproductive organ that is below the waist. I hope that you are men because of the one that is in your head. Now it's gone quiet. Please ask your brother for me, which one do you use the most? <laughs> <laughs> now all titles have been eliminated all those titles have been eliminated over here because you see this is one of the greatest challenges that we face uh, as men that we are good in everything that we do and sometimes, and we train ourselves to be good at what we do because we are comfortable functioning as managers and custodians and people who work in, uh, who operate in the place of dominion, but we rarely take time just to find out who we are. When you ask a man who he is, he will most probably define himself by several things. Number one, by his position. He will tell you who he is. Um, he will say, I am the MD, I'm the CEO, I'm the manager, I'm this, this, this. Most men will define themselves by their position. 
uh, you take away that position, they do not know who they are. You take that away, they don't know who they are. So they know that they are, uh, you know, running something or building something. They will mostly define themselves around that. The second is that they will define themselves around their performance. Their performance, what they are able to do. They'll define themselves around it. And if you take away the performance from a man like that, then that man is going to feel that he's not a man. His self-esteem will be uh, affected. So whether that performance has to do with his finances or his performance has to do with things like, um, you know, if, if he's a married man, if his performance has to do with his bedroom matters, a man can actually quit on life because he feels that he's not performing. In fact, a lot of men will run away from responsibilities just because they feel they're not performing. When they feel that they're not able to take care of families, they're not able to do certain things, uh, they're not functioning well, they will run. They will run. Um, because men like to define themselves by performance, you know, that's why we will have things like the blue pill, and Doc will tell you more about that. And, uh, so somebody will be getting to 60, but he has to perform. You know, he has to perform. Uh, don't worry, in a few years, in a few years, just a few years over here, you'll start battling with a few of these things. Uh, we meet, and, and there is an increasing number. Uh, there's an increasing number of men who feel a low self-esteem because they think they cannot perform, especially uh, sexually. So they'll be out there quiet, and they'll sit in a place and they feel everybody knows, even when nobody does because men define themselves by their performance. The third thing is that a lot of men define themselves by their provision. Their provision. Um, or I would have said possession. So it's what he has by his possession, rather, what he has, what he has. If he loses his money, if he loses uh, the car, the house or something, he begins to feel that he is not man enough he feels that a part of him has gone. Now, Jesus warned us about that in Luke chapter 12 and uh, verse 15. He warned us about that. He said, beware of covetousness because a man's life does not consist of the things that he has. And that is something that all of us need to understand, that a man's life does not consist of what he has. We will not all be at the same level. And when we compare ourselves with each other, we mostly are very content until we see somebody else who we think is doing better. And you really have got to overcome that element of defining yourself by what you possess. You can lose what you own, but you must never lose who you are. You can lose what you own, but you must never lose who you are. Glory be to God. So, um, men will you know, define themselves by, by that. They will define themselves by their position. And generally, that makes us a bit more competitive uh, because most of our engagements are external as well. Most of our engagements are external. I am doing well compared to somebody else. How well we are doing is normally compared to somebody else. And men are very competitive, very, very competitive, you know. Uh, rarely will you find, and maybe it is how we socialize ourselves, but rarely will you find, for example, uh, girls competing against each other in many ways. I mean, they will complement each other. They will share things. If a woman, if this was a ladies' uh, meeting or conference or something, by the time they are done, they've told each other a lot of things. Your hair looks good. Your shoe looks good. Your nails, where did you do that and all that? Uh, but if I asked you to compliment your brother right now, uh, you will actually, you know, use passive aggression or uh, reverse psychology. You don't know how to say you're looking good. You know, you wouldn't know how to say that. You have to size them up. You have to bring them down to your level. You have to say, you know, and nowadays you try. Because you want a you know. Because you just don't know how to tell a man that he's doing well. Because you feel that when you compliment the man, you're reducing yourself. 
you feel that him doing well means you're not doing well. And that is not true. And this is where for most men depression begins to come. Because we don't feel that we are man enough. We are defining ourselves a lot by the things that are outside. We're defining ourselves by the things that are outside. The houses we live in, the jobs we have, the cars that we drive. We, we still really, really, really want to hold on to what one man said, you know, toys. That we have that. Um, interestingly, that men will stick around toys and God, girls will stick around dolls. So they are still very relational. Now that goes back to the very beginning. And that's why I said when I started, my question was restored to what? But it comes back to the place of the very beginning. If we can just go back, who are we in the beginning? Maybe then we will understand why we behave the way we behave. So we are going to look at Adam a little bit uh, before the fall. We will look at Adam before the fall. So God says, let us make man in our own image. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, he says, let us make man in our own image. So man is created in the image of God. And what then is the image of God? Jesus tells us what the image of God is. He says, God is spirit. So every one of us sitting here needs to know that we are spirit. Every single one of us sitting here needs to know that we are spirit. Now, one of the things that life does to men is to try and cut them off from spiritual engagement. Because that is the foundation of who a man is. Man is spirit. You cut him off from spiritual engagement, he begins to die on the inside. And that's when he begins to define himself by the things that are external. He begins to grasp for what he thinks he's supposed to be. In Acts chapter 17 and around verse 27, Paul talks about that. And he says it's not that God is far from us. He says he's near us, but we are groppling in the dark. If perhaps we might find him. And most of us are in that place. We are trying to make sense out of God because it is only in making sense out of God that we make sense out of ourselves. We were created in the image and the likeness of God. We are spirit and we were created to function like God who is spirit. And how did God function from the beginning? Anything that he wanted to see, he spoke it. Anything he wanted to see, he spoke it. So the first thing that the enemy would attack about us is our image, our image of ourselves. And we lose the sense that we are spirit. Then he attacks our function, which is our speech. That we create things by what we say. In our kingship function as men, the scripture says that where the word of the king is, there is what? There is power. Which means when the king does not speak, there's no direction, there's no decree, there is no dominion. So he attacks us in the place of our speech. And that generally comes in how we view ourselves. So when you don't have money, you feel you don't have a voice. When you don't have something, you feel you don't have a voice. When you uh, are not in the place of the people that you think you should be in their place at their level, you think you don't have a voice. So you never really speak. You don't command things. Even if you speak, you speak from a point of weakness. And I, I do believe that this is the reason why every man needs to have his own money. So that he never loses his voice. He never loses his voice. You see, um, some of you, were, your voices are deep right here, but by, when you leave this place and you go back home, it goes back into soprano. You can't talk, you know. <laughs> you can't talk. Um, because just the side eye that you will be given will remind you that you buy nothing here. You know, it will remind you that you buy nothing here. So without exerting pressure, every man owes himself to have some money. Because of life, how we deal with it. Jesus said, uh, when they asked him in Matthew 19 and Mark 10, they asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And he said, uh, you know, uh, that's not how it was in the beginning. And they were raising up the issue of Moses. And he said, Moses only did that because of the hardness of your heart. So because of the kind of life we are confronted with, there are certain things. They may not be what defines you, but just to protect you in the generation you live in, you may need to have some money. Glory be to God. <laughs> just to protect you so that you 
are not insulted, you are not mistreated, you are not pushed around, you may need to have some money. You don't have to have too much, but just some. You need to have some money. You need to uh, have enough to have a voice. Praise God. You need to have enough to have a voice. You know, a man has to do whatever he needs to do just to retain that element. Because whether you, are, whether you have a job or you don't, if you are, for example, a husband, you will still be required by God to be the leader of that house. You are still a leader. Whether you have a job or not, whether she earns more than you or not, you are still the leader. You are still the head. Now, I'm not saying that you're the dictator there because some of you also, you overstep. You overstep. I mean, you can't let your wife be going out to make money and come back and then you collect everything in the name of you are the head of that house. No, you're not a head. You're a robber. I knew you'd be quiet there. Um, I told you, when it comes to money, men are something else with that money. Uh, some of us really, really, really intimidate the people that we have around us. But if you did something with yourself as well, used your hands, used your head, used your time, uh, went out there, you may not need to have what she has. I am a believer of this. I'm not a believer of 50-50 at all. I'm not a believer of 50-50 because Adam and Eve didn't come out at the same time. Adam came out first. There's no way I will be doing 50-50 with my children. A woman is nearly a child to a man. A woman is nearly a child to a man. The responsibility to take care of the woman was on the man. God brought forth the man. Then out of the man, he brought forth the woman. So the woman can't come out of the man to take care of the man. The woman cannot come out of the man to take care of the man. So we've got to understand that. It's just the same way the child will come out of the woman and God shows you the provision that he has made uh, for the child uh, on the breasts of the woman, that there is milk to feed the baby for a while. This is how God works it. So man's provision is actually in God. Man's provision is in God. This is why every man must remain spiritually alive and spiritually alert. Because that's where we draw everything from. You know, uh, God himself is called the breasted one. He is the breasted one. So the same way that a woman has breasts, God is the breasted one. And what are, the, what are those breasts supposed to feed? They're supposed to feed the man. So the enemy's mind is to keep men away from God who is spirit to make spiritual things look like they are feminine or weak. So men will then think that masculinity is about toughness and lack of emotion and no spirituality and we go into the place of just using our minds. Everything is mental for us and we begin to struggle. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, the scripture says, God formed the man out of the dust, and God breathed into his nostrils, and man became a living soul. The word soul there, from the Hebrew it is napash, which means the appetites. But if you look at it from the place of the Greek, it talks about the seat of the mind, the will, the intellect, and emotion. That it is the seat of the mind, the will, the intellect, and the emotion. So when you say that man became a living soul, man's intellect, will, mind, and emotion came alive by the Spirit of God. Without the Spirit, the man's mind does not function optimally. Without the Spirit, man's mind does not function optimally. So when we a spiritual, it doesn't mean that we cannot think well. In fact, we think better when we are spiritual. Romans 8 and 14, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. The Spirit himself, the scripture says in Romans 8 and verse 27 that he bears witness. Um, sorry, in verse, verse 15, verse 16, it says he bears witness with us that, is the, that we are sons of God. Then in Romans 8 verse 26, it says the Spirit helps us with our infirmities. 
with our weaknesses. Because we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit makes intercession with groanings that we do not understand. He says, he that knows the mind of the Spirit searches the mind of God and reveals that to us. We would never know how to commune with God without the Spirit of God. We wouldn't know. The first relationship that the male man had was the relationship with God, not with a woman. It was the relationship with God. If that foundational relationship is destroyed, every other relationship will be destroyed as well. When men do not know how to relate with God, to receive from God, to speak to God, they never really know what to do with the women around them. Because the women came from God. A good wife is from the Lord. A good and prudent wife is from the Lord. How do you handle something that has come from God when you are not in touch with God? How will you know the mind of God? Children are a heritage from the Lord. How will you raise them as a father when you're not in touch with God? Everything that will come to you has a manual and the manual is in the spirit. Glory be to Jesus. Everything has a manual. So the more I commune with God, the more I get to know what I need to do and function as a man, as a husband, as a father, anything that I need to be. I get to know that because then the Spirit reveals to me the mind of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, the scripture says to us that no one knows the mind of a man except the spirit of a man. Even so, no one knows the mind of God except the spirit of God. I cannot know the mind of God without the spirit of God. I cannot know the mind of God without the spirit of God. Without the spirit of God, even when you open the Bible, that thing will become something else. I mean, you can study everything in school and struggle with the Bible. Because the Bible was written by revelation. The scripture talks about it in 2 Peter chapter 1 and from around verse 15. Paul says we have not, uh, Peter says we have not followed uh, cunningly devised fables. These are not stories that were done by men. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty when the voice came up from heaven saying that is my beloved son. He said, we saw this. We were around there. John talks about it in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. He says, things that we have touched, we have handled, we have seen concerning the word of life. These are things that he says we have been witnesses over. And in verse 3, he says that we want you to have fellowship with us because our fellowship is truly with the Father. It begins with a place of having fellowship with God before we can declare it. He said, these are, not, these are not stories. These are not things that people just came up with. Luke writing about the works of Jesus, he says in Luke chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, I also decided to put together in an orderly account from the very beginning, because other people were also writing this. The eyewitnesses of these things were writing the things concerning Jesus. So I also put this together. Glory be to God. So it's important for us gentlemen, to understand that even the Bible was given by the breath of the Spirit. And since a lot of you are preachers, you know that. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, all scripture is inspired. It is given by the breath of God. 2 Peter 1.19, it calls it a sure word of prophecy. And it says, holy men of God in verse 20 spoke as they were moved by the Spirit. It did not come by their mind, imagination, just by stories. They were moved by the Spirit. Without the Spirit, you will not interpret the Scripture. Without the Spirit, you will not be able to interpret the Scripture. Glory be to God. So man is spirit. If man is spirit, then it means that man has to feed from the point of the spirit. Man has to feed from the point of the spirit. And man has to relate from the point of the spirit. So every man has to be grounded in the word of God. Because the word of God reveals the mind of God. It reveals the will of God. It shows us the ways of God. It gives us the wisdom of God. It does record the works of God. Every man needs to be grounded in the word of God. That word is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. That's what Paul was praying for the Ephesian church in Acts chapter 20 and verse 32 when he was leaving. He says, I commend you to God. That's, that's a statement for men. I commend you to God. You may not have had biological, physical, present fathers, but he says, I commend you to God. 
You cannot in this day use the lack of a father as the excuse for being less than you should be. He says, I commend you to God. He's a father like no other. He's a husband like no other. He's the kind of husband that will be a husband to the widows. He will take care of those that he didn't even bath out. He is that kind of a husband. He's that kind of a father. He's the kind of father that knows the things that you need. He says in Luke chapter 12, Matthew 6 verse 32, sorry. He says, your father knows you have need of these things. So if you don't know how to act like a father, you go to the word, you will find how your father behaves and you will know how to behave towards your children. <laughs> Glory be to God. You will know how, because that's our template. You will know how to behave towards your children. The scripture will teach us, behold, what manner of love the Father has given us, that we should be called the sons of God. So you get to understand that fatherhood and love are inseparable. Fatherhood and love are inseparable. Some of us are so militant that the moment you walk into your house, and this, even for the men of God who are in here, sometimes the only time people see you smile is in church. Your own children will see you smile in church with everybody. When you get back home, they don't know whom you have become. You are this authoritarian, militant tyrant. They don't even understand you. When they get to church, they see you smile and talk with people and you're so easy and you get out of the door and you hug people and they wonder, who is that? So your children want you to remain in church. <laughs> because that's the only place where they see a good version of who you are. Their wives who only sit in the service because they're protecting the image of the man. They don't believe anything he's saying. <laughs> they don't believe anything he's saying. They just sit there because they're protecting the image. They're looking at the children and they know all this man has is ministry. If I mess up this ministry, it will mess up the family and the children. So she sits there just because she is thinking of the children. She's protecting the children. She's protecting your image to protect the children because at least you pay the rent. So when she looks at it, she feels like, okay, at least he pays the rent. But if she was given an option, she would walk out. Because some of us as well do not allow the word of God to change us. Mark chapter 7 and verse 13, he says that you're making the word of God of no effect with your traditions. Interesting how you're a spiritual man in church and when you leave church, you're a traditional man. Your reasoning, your thinking, your culture, your socialization, you're a traditional man. The things you say, nobody will believe you even carry the Bible and go to church. Nobody will believe you. Your thinking about women, about children, the, your philosophy is absolutely skewed. You've been in church for so many years, but you will still talk about, you know, never let a woman know what you have. I mean, what Bible do you read? You cannot, I told you that, you cannot receive the thing of God and not go back to God to find out how to take care of it. The moment you disconnect the man from God, he becomes dysfunctional. And this is what the enemy has done over time. He has made us think that spirituality is weakness. I am so blessed to see all of you over here because this is not an easy thing to do with men. This is such a huge thing that is happening. I keep on telling Pastor Ben that this is such a huge thing that is happening over here. And especially that it is in Eastlands because there are so many young men who grow up and they don't even know and don't have their fathers. This is a huge thing because each one of us over here influences quite a number of people, even indirectly. It is an amazing thing that God is doing around here. Glory be to God. The struggles, the struggles that we feel sometimes that the word of God makes us weak because of the tradition that we have received. I wrote a book called Lions and Cage, and I talked about a man after God's heart, uh, David, being a man after God's heart. There are several things about David. David was a warrior, but he was still a worshiper. 
and he was not the kind of man that you would say is not really a man. And he embraced his weakness. When he writes Psalm 51, he says, you know, I was, I was shaped, Psalm 50, I was shaped in iniquity. I was, I was born in sin. He embraces his weakness. And he doesn't lose his strength. You bring war, he will fight. He will kill a giant. He will kill a lion. He will kill a bear. But he still will break down and worship God. He knows where to be a king and he teaches his son Solomon. So Proverbs chapter 1 verse 1, Solomon says the Proverbs of Solomon, the king of Israel, the son of David. He understands where to be a son and he understands where to be a king. I know that you have found your place of being a king, but where are you a son? Where are you a son? You have learned how to run business, run ministry, run everything. But where are you a son? You know how to, you know, use the, you are the head of your family. But where are you a son? Where do you sit and shut up? Who can tell you don't move and you won't move? Without giving you any reason. Without giving you any reason. Who is the kind of person that will give you instruction without explanation and you will take it and you will obey it and you will not grumble and even if you grumble, oh mama, you will just do what they said. One of the most abused uh, relationship, especially in the church today, is what we call sonship. We don't have sons. We are not sons. We are not sons. We are broke. We are not sons. What we call sonship is dependent on our resource level. I like how this house has gone very quiet right now. It's dependent on our resource level. It is Doc who sent me some photos the other day. Actually, yesterday, he just sent me some photos on my WhatsApp and I asked him, can I borrow these photos? And I did a post around them on how Bishop Timising was laying hands on Bishop uh, Masinde, then Bishop Masinde sitting down and Reverend Julian coming to kneel. And I say to my wife, this particular photo, I'll still use it another day. Because the man kneeling down there has all the money in the world. Today, even what we call spiritual sons in ministry only kneel as long as they have less than we do. The day, if you have a church of a hundred, the day they hit a hundred, you can't be their father. When they have 200, they will look for somebody who has higher because they have this skewed view of what sonship is. I have a son who is far taller than I am. He can't change his DNA. It's, it's, it's got to be trouble over here. He can't change his DNA. I will remain his father. No matter how tall he becomes, I will remain his father. No matter how rich he becomes, I will remain his father. Glory be to God. Because we don't know how to become sons, we don't also know how to become fathers. If we are misplaced sons, we will not know how to become fathers. We are transactional. That's why fatherhood as well has become a transactional thing. Because when we were sons, we were buying fatherhood. Now when we are fathers, we buy sonship. It's business. God is spirit. So man is spirit. Man begins his relationship right over there. It is the spirit of God that gives man his functionality. It's the spirit of God that gives man his functionality. So there are these things that we need to know and we need to learn. We need to, we need to be grounded in the word I say that. We need to be easy with worship. We need to be easy with worship. It is in that place of worship, gentlemen, that you release all your pressures. You release all your pain. This anger you carry, if you worshipped God, it would go. This bitterness you have, if you really worshipped God, the burdens would be lifted. In the presence of God is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
It's impossible for you to access the presence of God, bring the presence of God, and still carry your sorrow out of that. Mountains melt like wax. The hills keep like rams. The, the waters part when the presence of God comes. The writer of Psalms said, What ailed you, O sea, that you separated yourself? What did you see, O mountains, that you skipped away like rams? It is not possible that you soak yourself in the presence of God and keep carrying things that are not permitted by God. That's where you go to when you heal of all your father wounds and you go to when you heal of all your pains and you go to when you heal of your low self-esteem. When you rob yourself of spiritual activities like worship and giving yourself to God, you rob yourself of a healing mechanism. Because men don't talk to God, most of their secrets are with women. Are people still fine? You're still here? You're still alive? Because this is men alive. You're still alive. All right. Because men don't talk to God. Most of their secrets are with women. Not even with fellow men. It's with women. With a colleague. With a mother. A sister. Somebody in church. It doesn't always have to be an affair. It's just that men easily pour to women. See, we were created as, in quotes, offensive beings. We don't know how to defend ourselves. We were created for the offense. We don't know how to defend. So when Eve talks to Adam about the fruit, he doesn't know how to say no. When Delilah puts pressure on Samson a little bit, he doesn't know how to say no. Because we have no defense. Our defense is supposed to be God. We came from God. When we are faced with life, we are supposed to turn back to God and go there and pour ourselves and release ourselves and build ourselves to face life again. Every time we don't go back to God, we become vulnerable to life. Every time we don't go back to God, we become vulnerable to life. We won't have the answers. Scripture says that when you have wives that you live with them according to knowledge, what knowledge? You can read every book you want to read, but your wife is different from the next person's wife. Their personalities are different. Their preferences are different. So you have to get to know from God how to handle the woman you are given. Adam said, the woman you gave me. There is no standard woman. There is a woman you were given. <laughs> there is a woman you were given. Not the woman you like. The woman you were given. That's the one you live with. There is a woman you like. There is the woman you were given. See, you all are behaving here like... But, see... <laughs> if you keep quiet, your neighbor will know I'm talking to you. So just, just act like none of these things matters to you. You know, just act like this is a good word for people who missed. Yeah. There's a woman you are given, there's a woman you like. You know, the one that stimulates your thinking. You meet them and they know everything about your vision, where you want to go. They have a sense of direction. They know how you need to work around your ministry, your business. They know who you are. They dig you. Before you say it, they already speak your mind. That's the one you want. But now you are given another one. <laughs> you are given one who is just there. You know, you come in with your vision. You want to talk about your dreams. They're least bothered. You start talking about vision. They've gone to serve you food. They are coming back. They don't even care about what you were saying. They say, no, it's all right. Daddy, whatever God has told you to do, just do it. <laughs> now, you see... God never gives you anything that is complete. 
you have to perfect what you have been given. You have to perfect what you have been given. So even the woman you have been given is your responsibility. You want her to be intelligent, that's up to you. You want her to be presentable, that's up to you. You are the sculptor of the woman in your life. If you're lazy, you won't do a lot of chiseling. So she will be there as some mass, you know. But if you're diligent, you will shape it. You will shape it. She becomes what your mind tells you she becomes. <laughs> Praise be to God. You know, when we were courting with my wife, she, my wife was the most quiet person. Most quiet. In the initial years, when I introduced her to um, ministers that I looked up to, they would say, how will this one marry a minister? Because she would be totally quiet. She wouldn't talk. Our initial dates, I would be talking for two hours. And she'll just be quiet. She'll just be fine. Nowadays, uh, sometimes I feel I'm being overrun. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm not used to that. I'm not used to her out talking me. But then I've had to learn. And I realized that I have made her feel safe enough to express herself. She was not the kind of person to do public stuff. She wanted to be in the background completely. But now, there is, for example, a particular service. If I'm missing that service, she's the one who will do it. She's the one who will do that particular one. And she keeps on telling me, you know, it's you who's making me become this. Now, you can either admire a gifted woman in the house, or you can chisel this one that you were given. <laughs> You can admire one who is there, ready-made. Or you can chisel this one. There's something that David did in Second uh, Samuel chapter 6. There's something that he did. Um, and it's both good and it is bad at the same time. He went out to bring back the ark. And so he, they were dancing and everybody was around them. And they were dancing, bringing in the ark. But he left his wife behind. He left his wife behind. So he was doing a great thing, but he left his wife behind. When it came to his senses that he had missed out on an opportunity to raise his house, the scripture says he went back to bless his house. It is not complete until it happens in your house. It is not complete until it happens in your house. You see all these things that people say, how you're powerful, you're funny, you're exciting, they love your company. It is not complete until it happens in your house. Let me show you. Let me show you that. Pastor George, you see, we as men, we go out to conquer the world. We want the world. Even right now. Even right now, some of those phones ringing, those are deals. You know, we want to conquer the world. That's why you don't talk about small things. You would rather stay idle for one year because you're waiting for some big deal. You don't, you don't do small stuff. You, you know, so that's why you would rather go into gambling than go to work. Because you want the world. You want the world. You know, women... Women generally, they take off earlier financially because they start engaging early. They come out of college. They will take whatever job. They will go and be at an m -Pesa shop. They will be in a, in a pharmacy. They will be in a mobile phone repair, phone accessories. They will take up that. A guy will not do that. He's waiting for a proper job. Big deal. So his job in the first three years after college will be to be walking around with a girlfriend who's coming from work and then he escorts her and then escorts her back. So she's already picking up. She's already picking up. That's why somewhere along the line, they take off. Then what now we say, and you know, the more she goes to work, the more she's mentally engaged. Then she begins to look for men who can engage her at that level. Then when she finds them, then you say she's money-minded. 
that she had a sponsor. No, she didn't have a sponsor. She met a man who uses his head. Okay. Uh, she met a man who uses his brain. So they can have conversations. But I wanted to show you this. See, so men go out to win the world. They want to conquer everything. But one of the most interesting stories in the Bible is actually the story of Adam. I was looking at this thing. At some point, it hit me so hard that what we are looking for, Adam was given. Adam was not even looking for part of the world. He had the whole earth before him. But he lost it when he lost his house. You, you'll get it. You'll get it. He had the whole earth, not the world. The whole earth was at his disposal. When he lost control of his house, he lost the earth, not the world. He lost the earth completely. As a leader, I can afford to lose anybody. I can afford to lose anybody and everybody. But if I lose my house, I've lost my dominion. So we work so hard to win everybody. We work so hard to impress everybody. We work so hard to do things out there. And we easily miss out on what is the most important. The first man lost his finances by losing his family. He lost his company by losing his family. So you're first a family man. You're a spiritual man, then you're a family man before you're anything else. All right? If you're still here, say I'm here. I only have about three minutes or something, and then I will, I will drop this microphone. Praise God. So you're first a spiritual man, then you're a family man. Now, those are the things that the enemy will always come after. He doesn't want you to be a spiritual man, and he doesn't want you to be a family man. So even when you are present in your family, he disconnects you, disengages you, causes you to be disinterested. How many of us, for example, are raising sons? Let me just see by a show of hands. How many of us are raising sons? All right. For those of us who are raising sons, how much time do we spend around our sons? How much time do we spend? Not how much money do you spend on your sons. How much time do you spend around your sons? Because where will they draw their manhood from? How much time do you spend around your sons? How much time do you spend around your sons? It is said that it is said that when a baby in the initial stages, if you want to, uh, if you want to put in them self-esteem, self-confidence, you need to have direct eye contact for at least seven seconds with them. You look at each other, seven seconds, direct eye contact, it will build their self-esteem. Now, if we grew up not having that as normal, we have to learn it. We have to learn it. Look at Jesus. He spent a lot of time with the Father. So it was easy for him to go out and handle anybody else. When he was done with the people, he went to the Father. Before he was going to the people, before he went to the people, he went to the Father. Before he appointed his 12 disciples, he went to the Father. It was his custom, Mark chapter 1 verse 35, it was his custom to wake up early and go and speak to the Father. When he needed to raise Lazarus, he would say, Father, I thank you because you have heard me. This conversation was ongoing. Until one time Philip asked him, who is this that you keep on talking about called Father? Are we raising sons or even daughters who talk about us? Or are we absent so they have no stories about us? So when they are in school, when they are out there, they talk about their mothers because they have nothing to say about their fathers. My father was not present and whenever he was, he was high, he was drunk. So not much interaction. And so I did not learn that. I didn't learn that from 
a human being on how to be present. When I started meeting fathers who were present in the lives of their children, it felt strange. There is this bishop in South Africa. He sits with, and he's Indian, so they're very communal. He sits with his children who are in their 40s, and they come with their children as well. Every Sunday after service, nobody, not even his PA, will know where he is. And he will sit around the table with his children. Every Sunday, they will sit there. So I've been privileged to speak for him several times, and then he will pull me in. And I'll be around just this family. And I was seeing a model that I didn't have. They'll put aside their phones. They'll put aside everything. And they just hang out as a family. And they talk about all kinds of crazy stuff. He'll be sitting there and talking about his sons, how his sons need to have more children. And he'll be telling them, you're not doing enough. You know? And that time I'm cringing in me because um, we are socialized not even to talk about those kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, most of the things that you learned to do, you learned by default. <laughs> you learn by default. And even today, for those who are married and raising sons, probably it is your wife who taught your son how to pee. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I was in an all night, so I'm very spiritual. <laughs> it's your wife who taught them how to pee. They're learning the basics from a woman because you are not present. You're thinking about, oh, change the diapers. That's your son, gentlemen. That's your son. You are, you are keeping a pattern in that lineage. So nobody taught you, so you're not teaching anybody. You find it very difficult. You don't want the children around you. It's like the husband to the Shunammite woman. He has a son. The son becomes sick. He says, take him to the mother. You see, when you go home and then you are either on TV or you are on something or you are on your phone and you push your sons to your wife or to their mothers or for those of you who are not together and you keep on pushing the boy to the mother, you are losing the opportunity to write proper history. You're losing it. Those conversations are not easy, I tell you. So uh, sometimes when I want to break ice, because it's things that I've had to learn and I'm still learning. When I want to break ice, so we'll talk about football. We'll have conversations around something. We'll sit around the table and have, try to have conversations. My, my eldest son, at some point, we were losing him. We were losing him because he would go to the room and he has his gadget. He's an indoor kind of person and he would sit there and not bother with anybody. So I generally had to be pulling him out and taking away his gadgets and saying, you have to sit here and hang out with us and be with us. Now he's a bit more, especially when it comes to me, he's a bit more outgoing. He'll be a bit more expressive. Sometimes I've had to go with him into places, travel with him, stay with him, and it's something you learn. You literally have to learn. It will not be automatic. You literally have to learn, sit around each other, talk about anything, literally have to learn how to have conversations so that we don't raise another generation that doesn't know how to be them and they don't have a sense of self-esteem. I was in campus when a man first, the first hug I received from a man, a friend of mine, uh, he was this big brother figure in campus and when he did that, Doc, I felt violated. I was not used to men doing certain things around me because the male figure was strange to me. Apart from my peers and all of that, the male figure was strange. So male authority was strange. When I was in high school, I, I had issues with them because the male authority was strange. So how could a man come and tell me what to do when a man has never been telling me what to do? This is how we lose jobs. Because we have issues that are going back to the house. We don't know how to submit to a man. How to report to a man. So when we have a man coming over us, we feel that they are overstepping. 
See, why we talk to women most of the time is that women will not mostly use logic. They will use emotion. So it's how you feel. They empathize. So you can say everything and get away with it. But another man will see through everything and logic and we don't want to be accountable. So we avoid talking to men. We'll be hanging around each other and saying that we are cool. And then one lady will say, you know, check out on your friend. He's not okay. We trust them more. You know why? Because the breast is a more familiar place than the chest. Okay, I'm closing. I'm closing. I'm closing. We are done. You know, I know you're praying for me. I know you're praying for me. But it's a more familiar place because when you were suckling, that was a familiar place. You were nurtured by feminine energy. If you are not intentional about masculine energy, you will struggle with it. Praise God. I need to close there. You know, a good, a good minister leaves everything hanging because that's the only way they invite themselves the second time. <laughs> but to do a recap, we are spirit, gentlemen. We are spirit. And we need to be comfortable with spiritual engagements. We need to get back into the place. God is your source and the place of your resource. If you affect that, you affect everything else. All right? You will not know how to be a man, how to be a husband, how to be a father. You will be depleted. Kindly rise up on your feet. Let me rise up on your feet. I'm sorry, I didn't read the Bible. <laughs> One of the things that I pray that out of this fellowship we'll be able to do is to break the walls and be able to be vulnerable to one another. You see, eventually, you don't fail as a pastor. You don't fail as an MD. You don't fail as a CEO. You fail as a man. It is not your position or your title that is challenged. That's why you go down. No, it is the man in you. It is the man in you that occupies a particular position and you fail there. There's this gentleman. He is a pastor in South Africa. He's a Kenyan. He was doing so well by all standards of doing well. And uh, quite a number of years ago, whenever I would go, he would offer himself to drive me around different places. Good hearted guy had this good church, um, and you know places like those, they're not like our places here. Here you can pass a church of 5,000 people and still walk on foot. This gentleman, not a very big congregation, one time his Mercedes E300 was scratched on the side, and he stopped driving it, and one of the members said, Pastor, I've not seen you driving. He said, my car was hit a little bit on the side, and the member dropped an E350 brand new. So he parked two cars there. You know, sometimes I ask God why he called me to this side. Uh, sometimes I, <laughs> sometimes I, I, I've struggled with that thing. I've struggled with that thing. I don't know why. I've struggled with that thing. I keep on asking God, why did you call me to this side? But this gentleman would be very gracious and take me to different places. So a few years ago, he came back because he wanted to work on his peppers. But there was an, under, an underlying issue, rather, that his marriage did not take off well. So even when he was coming to check out his peppers, he was also trying to run away from his marriage. But he grew up in a system of church where you could not break the law. In fact, their marriage was arranged, but it was the kind of ministry where you could not say no at all. So they got together. Now, he says, you know, I've never had any attraction to 
my wife. The only part I've not understood is how they have children. I'm trying to figure that out, you know. I told you that for men, below the waist and above the waist are two independent states. <laughs> Those ones are not related. He can do things below the waist that he has no connection to above the waist. Those ones are independent states, completely independent. You know, um, they impregnate people that they say they're not connected to. Say, so, well, how did it happen? Was it through a test tube or something? You know, how Jacob undressed a woman at night without knowing who she was is a whole mystery, and that is one of our fathers in the covenant. <laughs> 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 there, there's, there's the original glory that comes on men when it comes to waste matters. Uh, you know, men only began, the man started seeing the other person only after they had fallen. Initially, the glory covered them, so they did not see anything. So there's a certain glory that covers, they don't see each other until... When they have engaged, that's when their eyes open and they discover they are naked, so they cover themselves. You know. So this gentleman has two children. So he comes here, disconnects from everybody, everybody, including ourselves, we couldn't reach him. So the people on the other side will keep on asking me, have you seen him? I met him one time at a mall, and he looked like he was covering up something. So I thought it was just the element of him having come back. He told me he would take my number, call me. He took it, he never called me. So recently, um, a friend of mine was running a prophetic service somewhere. So this gentleman somehow had gone there. Now, you know, prophetic meetings, if you're going to go there, you must have repented all your sins, struck a deal with God, and say, God, whatever my sins I have committed, forgive me, so that he doesn't need to bring them out. This gentleman sits at the back, and the prophet calls him out. So generally, I was running a service in Sokimau. Then a friend of mine from South Africa sends me this link. And he says, tell me about this man. Did he get married over there? So I was opening the link. I'm seeing something that I don't expect because I didn't expect him to have the link of my friend's church. Opened it about three times, and eventually I saw that. So I see this guy standing there with another lady. They are talking about his property in South Africa and all of that. Bottom line, his whole issue was blown up. He was trying to handle it. He was trying to run away from his marriage. He did not know how to tell people, including his father, who was a bishop, that his marriage was not working and he could not stay in it. And so he needed to come out of it. He did not know how to tell the woman. She's from Zimbabwe. He says she's about 14 years older than himself. And he didn't know how to tell her that he needed to leave. So he came to hide here. He, didn't, he wasn't failing as a pastor. But now the pastoral mantle was keeping him from addressing something that he was dealing with. Your title, gentlemen, is what is killing you. I'm ready to pray. Your title is what is killing you. You have to look like you're a king. You have to look like you're a man of God. So you're dying on the inside, but you cannot address it because the next person knows that you're an apostle who has planted 72 churches. You cannot struggle with marriage. You cannot struggle with sexual issues because your title is too big for your struggle. So your struggle is never dealt with because you are preserving your title. Until you find men around you that you can expose yourself to without a title, you will struggle, gentlemen. Until you find there are men even now standing right here who have sat in lounges and pubs and bars to sit there, not because they were evil, but they wanted to go into a place where they were anonymous. 
All right. They are not here, but they will watch whatever is being recorded. And they have sat in places and they have texted with people and flattered with people and they cannot even believe themselves that they did that because there was a deep longing. But then they kept on putting this title over here so they couldn't address it. What will people say when they realize? See, we are our worst enemies, gentlemen. We need to stop killing the men who remove their armor. If you find a man who has removed the armor and realize that he's leprous, don't kill him. A little girl, and this is why men run to women with their secrets. A little girl saw Naaman and saw the leprosy and went to the wife of Naaman and said, if this man would go to Israel, there's a prophet. What men do is when they discover there is a leprosy with Bishop Obed, they will go out and say, you see that man? He's not who you think he is. And so we are killing each other. And today, I just want to pray for us. It may not be everybody, but that you will find authentic relationships. Places you can go to and remove the armor and say, listen, this is what is going on. Places you can go to and say, I'm struggling with gambling. Places you can go to and say, man, I need to get out of pornography. Places you can go to and say, you know, there's this woman I'm taking care of here in Buruburu. So those times you see I disappear. There's somewhere over here, man. So if, if, if you ever hear that I've died there, be the first one to come, you know. <laughs> no, I'm telling you. Somebody you can go and tell, man, I, I, I cannot perform. A man told me uh, how they were having issues in the marriage because he was having erectile dysfunction. So the wife kicked him out of the bedroom. So you can't function over here. I had a guy who was my schoolmate. And at one point, the, the wife would tell him, you're useless. You're, you're good for nothing. When we sat together and I was finding out what exactly was going on, he said, did my wife tell you that I've cheated? I said, no. He said, let me tell you why she insults me. Because I cannot perform in bed. You know, there are men who are insulted because they perform everywhere. Okay. There are men who, you know... They perform everywhere. They're like Liverpool. They have played the optimal games in a season. They have played everywhere. They've played everywhere. They, they have the Carabao Cup. They have the Emirates. They, you know, they've played every, every final. But there are others who are being beaten because they actually can't perform. Be your brother's keeper. Man alive.